creates a new item that will open up opportunities and other things. What we're saying over here is that up till now, the incentives, the fiscal incentives that they have, focus more on sectors. So if you have a pretty much created industry finance, for example, and a person from tech and industry comes up, you ready, ready to know where, where you have to incentivize them from. Because you already have clear or decades long textile sector incentives. The incentives for automobile sectors, for cement industry, for fertilizer industry. What we are saying is that you have to move away from the regime of sector bidding and towards a more level playing field where you have incentives for ideas. So if today a scientist comes to the Ministry of Finance and says that, look, listen, I have this patent along with the feasibility for something like nanotech or something in biofuels. We are done stuff. You know, we just don't know where to, for example, give you this or provide you fiscal incentives for that. We just don't know that. So we, we have to put in place a regime which can incentivize them. Our cities have previously been decided, have been actually uh, considered, I would say, as suburban clusters. And we now need to, be, to rezone cities so that they can become dense clusters of diverse and creative activity to facilitate economic activity in several areas, but especially in retail distribution, transportation, where you can also have backward and forward indicators with the construction sector. Our argument in the case of cities is extremely important. Besides the role of urban management and economic growth, you have to know from the outset that it is the poor who actually come to cities for employment. And if your cities or your urban clusters cannot house the poor and provide employment to those poor, what you have is more acute urban poverty which we have seen in the recent past. Finally, the building of infrastructure using existing governance processes has not worked actually. We now have to improve governance and move towards a better public service delivery, where you don't have coordination and information failures within the government. So it's more about talking in terms of quantity and quality of public service delivery. So instead of looking at public sector development programs in, in terms of how many hospitals it opens, how many hospitals it opens, how many new education centers it opens, we have to focus about what quality of teachers are existing over there, what quality of students they are producing. A much more in-depth monitoring and evaluation process needs to be in place there. So if I had to check this, the, the springboards for a new development approach, for example, what would they look like? What we are saying is that we have to start from generating productivity. We have to reform internal markets, make cities and engines of growth, and focus on youth and community, which has to in turn sustain this productivity and growth in the medium and long term. And we do cross five themes which focus on governance and connectivity. Now, all this work is easy said and done. If I had to put it in a more schematic manner, being, uh, I'm sure some of the students of economics are going there, if you had to put it in a standard production function, for example, where you have human capital and physical capital, augmented also with the social capital, you could have human capital where the impetus has to come from global knowledge, youth, opportunities, and entrepreneurship and idea generation of idea like innovation. You can have impetus given to the physical capital through competitive markets and a sustained program for domestic norms. By putting in place creative cities where you have dense, dense clustering, connectivity and influence so on. And finally social capital, which is the next scope and theme in our development plans. This is the first time we are talking about it actually. It focuses on something that we talk about, norms, trust, culture, and their role in economic development. So if I, I just had to check this bit, I'm sure you'll have to give presentations on these as we go along. We've been discussing the issues regarding productivity and the reforms that we see as of now. Certainly, as we brainstorm and as we take stock of knowledge, 
you could have regular forms as compared to one over here. Just to give you an example, we are in a kind of structured program which binds a fiscal deficit to under 4% of GDP, which also implies that the existing development regime can't work because the existing development regime was fired through public sector investment, was triggered through, through public sector investment. So given that you don't have it, can raising productivity with existing capacity help? We just run over here a simple simulation where we raise average productivity of labor by 3% in major for last scale manufacturing and most empirically. Just to see the impact, in the top panel, you have the medium term framework for Pakistan. And its National Monetary Fund is suggesting that until 2015, the business as usual scenario would be that you would have an average GDP growth of 4.7%. If you focus on the same simulation that I told you, 3% growth in average productivity of labor in crop sector, last scale manufacturing, and goes in the area, you jump from 4.7% GDP growth to around 7% GDP growth in the same period using the same existing infrastructure that you have. Similarly, in case of domestic commerce, which has 30% share in GDP and a 20% share in employment, you again see room for issue, you again see room for development reforms which can in turn impact to a long way of Just to give you an example of how we have distorted or how we have systematically disincentivized our own domestic sector. There are 750 firms listed on the Karachi Stock Exchange. You will be surprised to know that only one software house is listed. There are only three Firms that actually give to a great experience in Pakistan. Only four dedicated construction firms. And in case they are sugar mills, 37, just to tell you that in Pakistan, investment has only flowed in sectors where government has been given incentive. It is the rent seeking regime that shows right over there. You don't have incentive in their sector. An ideal sector where your incentives primaries would be like a law, the software sector. You don't see software in the When we come to creative cities for inclusive development, we are much impressed by the literature by Richard Florida and Jane Jacobs. We talk about the three themes that help in many cities creative. The scans, technology, and tolerance. When we come to the reforms for cities, we have a I give an example to tell you, for example, when we feel short of ideas about how to attract foreign direct investment in Pakistan, amid security and non situation, we are forced to look at other war zone or conflict prone economies like Israel, Lebanon, Sri Lanka, Indonesia, Philippines. How do those countries with such huge war zone threat manage to maintain their investment values? We see an example over here and give you hypothetical extrapolation. You see the growth of these retail experiences in Pakistan. In a hypothetical case, you have eight cities with over one million population, and this is according to the 1998 census. They must have grown by now. There are five retail centers running in Pakistan with an average investment of 2.3 million each. A hypothetical example over here would be that if you allow two such centers in eight larger cities through proper zoning and building regulation, to inclusive zoning, this can readily attract around $430 million of foreign direct investment, employing around 5,000 people. This is something you can readily do if your domestic demand. It's the sixth largest population in the world we are talking about. It's a ready opportunity for foreign direct investment. You just have to open up your sectors. 
This has to jeopardize what we call zoning and building regulations in the city. It's nothing out of the box actually. Finally, youth and community. This is probably the closest to ours. Because any term of short term, any sort of short term growth spur will not convert into sustained economic growth if you don't tap the brain deal versus brain training that they have right now. You can produce as much human capital as you want, but if you can't retain that human capital, if you can't retain that youth, you're probably again draining your human capital for the growth of other reasons. So this is something to take away because these four things will be discussed with you in greater detail. What we want is for you to focus, for you to think hard on these four things and get back to you with your, I'm sure, very constructive feedback. Right at the outset, what we're talking about is that it has to be focused on rules and not means. It has to be, we have to incentivize innovation. The production function now has to be aligned in a manner that we have ideas-led innovation. Innovation-led productivity and productivity-led growth. We have to remove obstacles, and by obstacles we have mean the barriers to entry and exit in Pakistan. We have to increase resource mobility to increase the zoning. And you have to empower communities for a good quality of life. I'm sure you'll join us on later presentations which will explain these things even further. Thank you very much for your attention.